CPR, Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween and Middle School for Life. Well, it's 23 hours and 30 minutes into the 17th day of uh, October, and we are starting the observation vlog for today. Uh, I finished off talking about getting into an area of the topic uh, beyond Hegel into the nature of Hitler, and I'm going. To, this one is this this today's uh, verbal essay is going to be titled "Hitler and the New World Order." And the problem is, is that, as I said before, the New World Order isn't one thing. It's a variety of different things. But yet everyone talks about it as a single or as a single sort of plan. But there isn't a single plan. And, 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 and what I'm, why I'm bringing Hitler is Hitler was the failure of one of the first New World Orders that we talk about in terms of modern history. But we will go back and correct it. We will sort of put a, uh, an asterisk there for the, the uh, Hitler's New World Order. Uh, in that, a large chunk of what's happening today is repeating itself. It's not new in history. Even though Lionel says everything's brand new, we've never seen this before, this is not true. And this is the part of, the, part of Lionel's problem is he hasn't done far, he doesn't, a large chunk of the pieces that he needs to put the puzzle together are simply not within his uh, within his scope, within his experience. So there are there are significant pieces missing. As I said before, and I said this in, in the last uh, in the last uh, 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 observation vlog, that Hitler sat at the end of a period of what we'll call social engineering, and in many cases, Hitler was on the side of genetic engineering, believing things were genetic. Where do you find this in 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 in, in, in uh, popular culture and popular history? Well, look at the origins of Spider-Man. I mean, look, look at the origins of the origins of Superman. Look when they when they came out. Go back into a history on comic books, and you'll begin to understand from H.G. Wells on that there was this fascination. And each H.G. Wells was near the end of the 1800s. They understood breeding and genetics. A large chunk of what we're seeing today in terms of moving forward in terms of the science fiction, there is a huge relationship between science fiction. Uh, and science, and it's always been there. So to say that Hitler, when you talk about Hitler, and you view Hitler as, as the thing, well, you're missing a whole chunk of the paper, a whole chunk of information, because there's a lot behind it. Uh, I, I this is one of the gentlemen I was talking to earlier, uh, earlier this week. I mentioned the Bible. He just kind of scoffed at it and said, "Well, the Bible." Is, is, that's a serious comment? Is, well, yeah. But the thing is, is that most people don't understand what the Bible is. And again, this is the problem with conspiracy theorists. You're, when you see something like the Bible, you're seeing the tip of the iceberg. You're seeing maybe 10% of what's actually there. The rest of the 90% is not hidden. You have to go through other aspects of history in order to understand the 90% of the Bible that's not really seen. And this is the same thing. We can talk about Pizzagate. Pizzagate is simply the tip of the iceberg. It is not the iceberg itself. Uh, so 90% of what, what people talk about in, the, uh, in terms of Pizzagate, it's completely missing. It's not seen, not even discussed, not even remotely discussed. And this is, the, this is what you see almost from conspiracy theory to conspiracy theory to conspiracy theory, even those who are called themselves vaxxers. They're not dealing with complete information. They're doing deal, dealing with partial information. And their ideas are found in a minute. Oh, I found this study here. I found that study there. Well, these studies aren't the research papers. The research papers, most people, when, because you sit down, I've, I've brought this out to these vaxxers. And we sat down and had this, oh, you want to talk about the research paper. You want to talk about the research. So you bring out the research paper with these journal science, the journal nature, and you go into basically protein chemistry, you go into organic chemistry, and within 10 minutes, their eyes are rolling in their head. You, you, within 10 minutes, you lose them. They, 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 they go, stop, stop, stop. I don't know what you're talking about. What does this have to do with the vaccine? They, they, they can't make the connection. 
And it doesn't matter what you say after that because they, you know, this is also true of the anti-vaxxers. You go and explain the chemistry. You know, you go beyond the, oh, this study says this and this study says that. You go actually go into the research. You, you bring out the research. You know, these, these boring lab reports. And once again, their eyes are rolling in their head. And <laughs> Daniel, 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 come on, stop it, man, please. You give me a headache. And that's the that's that's the end result. They don't understand what's happening. They, they, they and it's, it's because it's so far outside of their experience that they can't possibly bring it in. There's no way for them to, to sort of connect with your experience. I had these experiences, but I've been in the lab a long time. But this is why I'm out here. I do research every day and night. And when I go inside, I'll be doing another form of research. It'll be a transition to. To the uh, the back research desk, which is the media room, the media room research desk, and uh, as I'm doing uh, the YouTube scroll, I'll also be uh, starting the meditation over again for the day, uh, while fixing up some of the research that sort of has to be gone over and reviewed uh, before I enter it into a notebook. Uh, and this is kind of this is the routine. This is what typically goes on. And the thing is, because most people aren't doing this, not within their experience, and they have, like, I've been doing this for 30 years, this is what gives me my sort of capacity, I've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, and so I've seen a lot. There's a lot, to, a lot of pieces to my puzzle. Have I put the entire puzzle together? Nowhere near. No, there is so much more that this is what I talk about being, you know, Cyborg Alpha, uh, you know, we are, we, we are alive. And talk about cyborg, cyborg Alpha as the infinite tween, as middle school for life, because the knowledge that you're seeking, you understand is infinite in nature. In other words, it's an asymptotic point. You're never going to reach it. You can only approximate it. And this is something that, that, that is really not understood. So when you talk about Hitler, Hitler is the top point. That's the iceberg that most people see. There is 90% that is not seen. This connects all the way back to H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells was a contemporary, if you will, of Dostoevsky. And a large chunk of what's going on today is influenced by a large chunk of these people's writings. Their writing and books become the drivers of history because they drive the current event, they drive the current understanding that the striving for what they consider to be perfection. They wanted, they saw the problems, the social problems. How do we get rid of these social problems? How do we stop them? Oh, well, we do this, or well, we do that. There was a point in time, there was a, a, a science called, and this was near the end of the, near the beginning of this, a, a science called phren phrenology. And it's basically believed that the nature of a person in terms of their criminal nature resided in the bumps, because if you feel your scalp, it's not smooth. There's a lot of bumps in it. Well, those bumps were called, studying the bumps on the person's head was what they considered to be. Well, this is uh, uh, this is what created crim criminology. So what created created criminal. So if you were studying criminology, you'd be studying people's bumps on their heads. Uh, it's so the shape. Of, some people believe because they they had the, the, the theory of Darwin that we had evolved from eight that if your forehead was a certain shape uh, or you had a unibrow that you were. Were, had uh, genes left over from primitive man, and this would give you a primitive nature, and that you could never be, um, you could never be within proper society. Uh, there is an old movie. There's a the movie in the 1990s and 1980s called The Elephant Elephant Man. Go take a look at that. It's based on something real. Named John, a person named John Merrick, and you'll begin to understand how people viewed people with disabilities and different differences that were not accepted or not were considered to be normal within society, you'll see this all the way back in the 1800s. So what happens is that the the eugenics here comes into this at the end of phrenology. Phrenology fails uh, uh, a large chunk of what you see in Sherlock Holmes. The logic begins to fail. So they'll look for other things. And as the logic fails, they go into eugenics. They go into genetic diversity. They go into... Uh, Breeding, who you had as a father, who you had as a mother, mattered. Uh, who you married 
matter. You had to, you have to be married. You have to marry a person of a good stock, and then that was they, they were being judged by their physical appearance, by their manners, their their, their demeanor, uh, all these different things would determine how well built this person was. This was talking about pedigree. Look at a pet show show and look at the pedigree. Well, pedigrees applied to people near the end of the late 1800s. You had to be of a certain pedigree in order to be at any certain period, certain level of class. Where you were in society depended, depended on your pedigree. And as this, again, the pedigree began to fail. Because all you have to do is look at the Haps person and see some of these royal families who were in bread, start seeing some of the insanity that was going on. They began to realize, hey, this wasn't it, so they began to look more into eugenics. That you that, that people were, uh, were, were were born like this, but that you had to have certain genetic traits. And this is when they began describing people as morons and idiots. Idiots and morons came into the vocabulary around uh, the end of the eighteen uh, end of the eighteen hundreds, uh, about eighteen eighty, eighteen ninety. That's when it starts coming in, and people are being classified as morons. Go back and look at a uh, a television show called. Uh, the Three Stooges. We call it a television show. At that time, it was a movie reel. There wasn't a TV at, in the 1930s. That what you did, if you wanted to watch these, to watch these short films, they called the half-hour programs. There would be Saturday matinees. You would go to a movie theater. You'd pay a nickel to get in, and you'd spend all day long uh, watching movies. This is this is what there was also something called Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon is not the original name of, of, the, of the TV channel. Nickelodeon comes from these machines that, as you reeled them around, uh, gave you flipping pictures. Some of them were silent. Some of them had a bit of sound to them, not much. But you put a nickel in, that's what's called Nickelodeon, to watch a movie. And this is where Three Stooges emerges from. And it's about uh, three gentlemen who never live anywhere except they're in rooming houses, boarding houses, and they don't actually have a job. And why? Why don't they have a job? Well, they're, 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 they're idiots, and it's all slapping each other. And, you know, it becomes a comedy. Oh, that, that slapstick is all for guys. Oh, no, there's a satire behind it, because at that particular point in time, if you were classified as a moron, you could not hold a job, you could not own an apartment, you could not rent an apartment, because you couldn't sign in. These people were, were, were functionally, they were illiterate. They couldn't read or write. They couldn't write their own names. That's why you had the X's on the contract. Every time you see an X on a contract now, when you have to sign something, they put they put an X there. That was because that was the signature. People who couldn't read and write would put their signatures down as an X. That's the history. And they began sterilizing people. Anyone who was, was considered to be a moron to get rid of them, they began to sterilize them. Some of them, they actually began to euthanize. Right? Well, these people are suffering. They, 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 they did this for people with Down syndrome. They did it for uh, multiple sclerosis, for cerebral palsy. These people would be euthanized. They wouldn't be allowed to live. There is a documentary you can find on YouTube called The Killing Nurses. Go take a look at that. And you'll begin to understand how Hitler emerges from this environment. It's an environment where the, the understanding of how society works and how it should work is that you have to get rid of the people who are defective. And in that sense, in that development, you, which you, what you get is you get a perspective that under certain conditions it's all right to kill people. That this is a solution. You're putting them out of their misery. And this, is a, this type of society is an amoral society because their morals have been fundamentally shifted so that something that would have been horrible and horrific at, at a certain point in time is no longer. They're, they're no longer the called gentle civil society. They've now become feral. They're wild. They're like animals. And this is where you start seeing, the, in the 1930s, you start seeing the anarchists come out. This is where the anarchists are. Before then, you have the, uh, before the anarchists, you have the nihilists. The nihilists and, and the anarchists are the old terms for basically the uh, the nihilists. The nihilists became the beatniks. The beatniks became the hippies. That's your path. Nihilist, beatnik, hippie. They were the love childs. They were they they were 
the, do all the drugs you want. Do anything you want to do. Everything is it's, it's a wonderful life. Everything is, uh, 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 in life is a concept. There's no reality. So do whatever you want to do. <clears throat> but there were those who understood this sort of, had the perspective of that they couldn't simply let society collapse, that they had to push it over, that there was just something that had to be toppled. This is where you're seeing the, this toppling of the statues. And these became, the, the, the postmodernists who became like who became violent, were the anarchists. They believed that instead of sitting back and allowing society simply to collapse, that they had to push it over. They had to get in there, get active, and push it over. And that in the destruction of society, and this is the Hegelian, Hegelian dialectic, at the same time you have the conflict between the the anti-establishment, which are the, the 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 anarchists, and you have the battle between the establishment and the anti-establishment. This battle, in the destruction of the two, would produce progress. This is the term progressive. This is where it evolves from. You can go and you can actually find a history on this. Now it's not always going to be in textbooks, but matter of fact, it's almost never going to be in textbooks. And it might be in some dictionaries, but most dictionaries no longer uh, have that sense of history to it. These are the things you're going to have to piece together from bits and pieces all over the internet. You can do it. It's, it's not, a, not an impossibility, but you just take the words that I'm talking about, the different points, Google them, and start building a library of different uh, sources. Read through them and start seeing what you begin to understand. Uh, that's how you do the deep dive research. But unless you do that, you're not going to have any form of understanding of what's actually going on. It is a difficult thing. But I think they understand now, from this whole structure that we've talked about now, we haven't mentioned Hitler because Hitler sits at the end. He's one person at the end. So what happens, Hitler comes into all of this. He says, I've got a solution. We're just going to start killing everybody. And he, 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 well, he couldn't say that. He had us do what Edward Bernays does. You have to create the environment for consent. And the Nazis in the United States was were very, very popular. To understand that, you have to go look and do the history, do a history, historical search on Operation Paperclip to find out how Argentina was little Germany. How the U.S. base in Antarctica was the Nazi base in Antarctica and began shifted hands at the end of World War II during Operation Paperclip. This is where your, your rocket program comes. You look at NASA. NASA is a not NASA. NASA is a Nazi science program. You want to look at genetics, uh, like Pfizer or Merck or, or uh, Bayer Monsanto. They all were Nazi organizations. They had Nazi people, doctors, researchers, who were working under Joseph Mengele. So there is a connection. There is a history there. And, 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 and to say, oh, these people are not the same people. This, they are the same people. They have the same beliefs. They have the same understandings. And so they're working from their perspective in trying to create a new world, a new world order that they see is the proper way to go. But, of course, you have a lot of people on the bandwagon. You have a lot of people sort of Want to cutting in and sort of making their profit, making their way in the whole situation. Uh, so you have not just these people; you have a lot of other people involved as well, who are sort of you know there as a bandwagon. I mean, look at George Soros. People, say, oh, George Soros is a George Soros, New World Order. Oh, well, look at his history. He was one of the Jews, and I don't call him actually call him a Jew, but he doesn't he doesn't believe in Judaica. Judaica. He's a you know in some other, in ways of lab of a lapsed Catholic, a Catholic who no longer believes. This is like Lionel LeBron. He is retired, but he's now become a lapsed Catholic, Catholic because he's uh, now more of an atheist than anything else. And you can sort of see the same thing here is with, with, the, with, with, with the, what we call people of Jewish descent. So George Soros is of Jewish descent. What did he do as a child? He, he, he ratted out his own people. He went and pointed out where certain Jews were living, and he turned them in. This is what he did, and this, this is on record that he, he he did this. So it wasn't just simply, oh, these are all, all it's all Hitler. Hitler did, did the entire thing. There's more to it than that. If you're sitting there talking, and, and, and this is what Lionel, 
oh, we don't want to hear about Hitler anymore. You need to go in and study the history because it's not about Hitler. Hitler was at that again. Talk, bring out Hitler and just talking about Hitler. Oh, this is a Hitler type of thing. Without going into the detail, that's the person who's seeing only ten percent of the iceberg. You're seeing the top layer, you're seeing the visible layer, but you're not going into the ninety percent that's actually there. And this is unfortunately what Lionel does. He doesn't go in the rest. He says, "Well, I do this a much more in depth on on, on my on my private channel where that you have to subscribe to." And of course, he does it on Twitter as well. But I've read his Twitter feeds; they're not much different than what he says in in his uh, in his um, in his broadcast. So the thing is, what do you want to do? Do you want to do something that is you know my stuff is free? I'll give you all the information that he has. I'll give it to you for free because it's part of my research. It's part of what I do. This is part of my research. These are uh, the essays are are coming from my notes. This is a this is the first draft essay of my notes. And this is what scientists do. You keep a log of what you're doing. And so you're seeing part of what I'm doing because I can't put everything out on the internet. So this is part of the work that I do. You're seeing part of the research. Anyways, uh, I think I'm going to leave this here for now. I think this is good enough for, for 20 minutes. As I said, you, you, if you really want to get into things, look up uh, look up H.G. Uh, uh, Wells. Look at the history of of, of uh, science fiction. You'll begin you'll begin to see that there, there's an enormous amount there to science fiction. The comic books. Look at the history. Look at the history of comic. Look where Spider-Man came from. Superman. Look at their histories. There's an enormous history there that, that, that most people who read comics have no clue about. You know, there's things there. And start building your knowledge library. The, the, your, your, your library of the mind is your knowledge library, your experiences. If you don't connect the things that are beyond you, and this includes history, and this is what history is, then you're going to have a very limited knowledge and you're going to be tricked like you wouldn't believe. You're going to be sold information that isn't true simply because you do not have the connection with history. You cannot go back and check and say, well, how do I know this person is telling me the truth? You have to do the research. We are Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween and Middle School for Life.